Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Paul Robinson. Um, I'll be your Master of Ceremonies for the week. I'm the Director of Business Development here at iSecure. Um, in case uh, folks are unfamiliar with iSecure and what we do, we are an information and cybersecurity con consulting firm based out of Rochester, New York. Uh, we do have offices based in Connecticut as well that cover the tri-state area down there, but our headquarters are out of Rochester, New York. Um, just to give you a little bit of introduction of what we do over here, our philosophy at iSecure is education and the education of our clients. iSecure does not have customers. Um, we feel customers is a word that we use for a transactional-based um, discussion. And we're having here, especially with Webinar Week, as you'll see, is that we are strictly working with folks on the education piece of, uh, of navigating the terrain of cybersecurity. It's going to be a really, really good week, good, exciting week. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items that I wanted to uh, give to you, and you'll probably hear this nine or ten times if you're signed up, but I'll, I'll go through it quickly. We are live tweeting this webinar uh, week and all the presentations. So if you want to uh, follow along, um, we will be live tweeting all presentations with a hashtag of iSecure SWS. That will be the hashtag that will be associated with the, uh, with the webinar week. I wanted to uh, have the, uh, the pleasure of introducing Yotam Gutman. Uh, Yotam comes to us from Sensai, and um, Yotam comes to us also from Israel. And uh, if you are astute to the uh, news and things that are going on over there, um, you can understand that there is a, a sacrifice for Yotam to come in here and to give us this presentation. So, at, you know, from iSecure, we are greatly greatly appreciative of the fact that he will be um, presenting to us today about uh, cyber intelligence being the missing ingredient to cybersecurity. And I think that's an important thing uh, to, to recognize and to uh, understand is that uh, cybersecurity, you, the, uh, the 2.0 version of it is let's throw as many high-end products and solutions at the, at the uh, problem and then hope to God that it stands up and, and is able to, to thwart attacks where um, the intelligence piece is, is, most, is mostly very important to organizations to make sure that we as IC, IT security professionals understand the terrain and also can pass that intelligence along to our end users as well. So Yotam and his organization focus in on that. It's a great, great um, organization that we've come to know recently, and uh, I guarantee you that you will get something new and exciting out of this. So without further ado, ado Yotam, the stage is yours, and again, we thank you so much for presenting for us today. Thank you, Paul. I hope uh, everyone can hear me just fine. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Paul and the team for, for hosting me. It's a great uh, opportunity, as, as Paul mentioned, to help with uh, education and, and raising awareness, and we're very happy to participate in any such uh, activity. Uh, the presentation uh, or webinar will be comprised of a quick preamble, introduction to cyber intelligence. I will discuss the methodology that we're using, which is quite unique. And I will try to speed through this uh, rather boring part and go straight, straight to the uh, test cases, which are a real life example of different incidents of cyber inc uh, incidents. Uh, and then I hope to leave uh, ample time for a QA. Uh, so please. Uh, if you have questions, I try to, to save them for the final part, and I'll be happy to, to answer them. And uh, even after the presentation communicates, uh, my contact detail will appear towards the end. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I live in Israel, as Paul mentioned. Uh, I'm an ex-naval officer, so I don't come from an info security background. Uh, per se, but I've been with the industry for about a decade here in Israel. There's a close uh, bond between uh, intelligence, the defense, homeland security, and cyber, uh, where everyone understands that cyber is currently the weakest link in any security apparatus, and uh, there's been a lot of uh, emphasis and uh, uh, work going into that. So uh, uh, I like to spend my free time surfing either the web or the ocean, which means that I'm prone to attack either by, by jellyfish or by cyber criminals. Uh, but I'm not the only one. Everyone who's been around is a target nowadays. And uh, this is exactly what this presentation will discuss. Uh, it's important to say that I'm not going to touch uh, about uh, discuss technology in depth. 
uh, that's not my area of expertise and it's not the field of this presentation. Uh, there are other terrific webinars about more technical aspects, but I will say this, uh, technology is a vital ingredient of any cybersecurity apparatus, but it cannot be the only one, uh, otherwise we would be standing here and talking. Uh, terrific companies out there with great security as infrastructure have been breached. So with that in mind, we all realize that we do need uh, uh, an additional layer, and in our eyes, this is intelligent. Uh, one last item before I start. Uh, we, we have been uh, experiencing some uh, rocket attacks in the last the couple of days, so I might be forced to pause for several minutes and, uh, and uh, move to another room uh, to seek shelter. If that happens, I will let you know how long it will take me to, to come back something like five minutes, so please bear with me, and I hope uh, uh, the guys in Gaza will, will help me complete this uh, web app uh, without interruption. Moving straight into a cyber uh, intelligence update from the recent uh, events that we are facing here in Israel. Uh, politics aside, uh, it's important to note that any uh, event taking place in the physical world has some manifestation in the cyber realm, and uh, especially uh, uh, violent situations like the one we're experiencing now. So the, the skirmishing between between Israel and, and the Hamas is uh, closely followed by by a cyber front, if you like, uh, but it's uh, slightly different, uh, whereas in the in the real world, we're fighting with, with jets and, and bombs and, and rockets. In the cyber, people use the tools that they have at their disposal. And Israel as a country is facing uh, what you might call cyber terrorism or, or hacktivism, depending on your political point of view. But the reality is that Israel uh, websites, uh, Israel government websites, and also commercial ones are facing hacktivist activities from all around the region. Uh, one example is you can see Operation uh, Save Gaza, which is run by a Tunisian group called uh, Anongos. Another one, which is called Intifada, that's a uh, public uprising in, uh, in Arabic, which is uh, uh, led by uh, two groups, uh, one from, from the region and another from, from Morocco, which is quite uh, far away. Uh, and, and, and no such campaign is, is complete without a phishing campaign. So we've been seeing emails. This one was distributed uh, a week ago, and it says uh, that was before the actual uh, uh, battle started. And it says, if you want to know about the secret offensive plan, please open this file. And, and this one uh, contained a, a Trojan, and this was distributed by a, a local uh, hacker team in, in Gaza. So uh, we are facing uh, uh, hostilities on, on several fronts, and it's uh, quite uh, unique for us to be able to witness this in, 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 real, in real life and, and bring these alerts to our customers. So uh, moving on to more uh, generic uh, definition of what cyber intelligence is, and I'd just like to say that cyber intelligence is a very big world. It's quite the hype today in the industry. And we all know that major breaches occur. But what I would like to say here today that even the, the most uh, sophisticated and, and uh, devastating of bridges starts with a small thing. So if you've seen the movie Prometheus or Lawrence of Arabia, you know the saying that big things have small beginnings. And, and in our case, uh, uh, this uh, huge breach started with a rather innocent uh, a post on a Russian hacking forum, which was posted uh, late February uh, last year, uh, offering to, to sell a piece of uh, malware, which was designed to steal a, a, a credit card information from point of sale device. This specific one was called Black Post, Post being point of sale. It was sold for several thousand US dollars. And uh, about uh, nine months later, this exact same malware was the one used uh, in the famous or infamous uh, target grid. So this is how this thing starts on a, a rather conspicuous ad on some uh, bulletin, and, and it goes on and on and on uh, with events that no one can actually predict. So, so please bear in mind, 
uh, about this incident, and this is the one that I'll be discussing later throughout the presentation. And uh, just one theoretical word before we move into the more uh, concrete world, I believe that any cyber uh, security mechanism or uh, infotech, uh, if you like to call it that way, has to have three uh, ingredients. The most uh, crucial one, and uh, I would be that the, the last, uh, the first person to admit that is technology. You have to have your firewall, your IDF, your mechanism in, in place. This is a must. And if you don't have that, I would even say don't bother with intelligence until you get this uh, infrastructure in place. Then there's people. There's the people who operate this, people who operate the same, who man the security operation center. Uh, and people who usually are the people who make the mistake, the employees, uh, uh, and these people have to work with, with procedures, and these people have to have awareness and understanding of what's going on. And, and the third ingredient, and is the, the most recent addition to this uh, apparatus, is intelligence. You have to have updated intelligence about what's going on in the world around you. You have to have it to keep your uh, technology updated your system, have to be looking for the right types of malware signatures. Your people have to be informed of the new type of threats. Uh, for instance, a, 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 a crypto locker uh, or other types of uh, crypto mechanism were not such a big deal until last year when, when they exploded and, and started affecting uh, a lot of organizations. Uh, Mobile malware was not very big until a year ago. So these things are developing very rapidly, and it's only with intelligence that you can keep up to date or close pace with the uh, hackers and the bad guys. And uh, actually, this was acknowledged uh, about a month ago by Gartner, the analyst firm, who identified uh, threat intelligence as one of the 10 uh, promising technologies for InfoSec in 2013. Threat intelligence is another industry name for cyber intelligence. Uh, you can read the Gartner report, uh, if you like, in the, in the link that is attached here. Uh, what's important for me to say is that we are seeing a, an industry-wide trend toward uh, bringing cyber security, cyber intelligence into the more uh, uh, commonplace solution, and we're very happy with this trend. It's still not uh, enough in terms of commonization and common language, but it's definitely making big strides in this uh, direction. Uh, the approach towards cyber intelligence uh, should encompass the, the three phases of cyber attack. It should encompass the pre-incident, uh, the incident itself, and the post-incident. And there are different types of intelligence which can uh, uh, be used for each type or, or each uh, phase of the attack. So for pre-incident, what a, a good cyber analyst would like to do is try to understand the intention, who is going to attack the organization, what tools are they going to use. You want to gauge the threat. Is it, is it a, a, a real menace or just a nuisance? During the incident, we would like to detect and mitigate as quickly as possible. And here, cyber intelligence can help us uh, with the proper uh, uh, characterization of malware, which helps our system to detect it faster and better. And incidents do happen, and after the incident, we want to do uh, damage control. Uh, so we want to, if we can, we want to find the attribution, who has attacked us. And if that's not possible, we want to try to retrieve the information or at least estimate uh, how many of it was lost, or even try to get some of it back. In terms of cyber activity, on the left-hand side, uh, we've mapped the players, uh, starting from government, uh, moving on to the criminal, the terrorist, and the hacktivism. On the right-hand side, you can see the gauge for severity. Governments, of course, have the power to inflict the most substantial damage in terms of cyber, but they rarely do so. And if they do, we have to face that there's very little we can do. I can tell you that in terms of cyber intelligence, we can detect very little about government or state-sponsored activities. Uh, on the top, we've listed some of the sectors which have been badly hit or we foresee to be on the target list of, of the terrorists, uh, this for the coming year. And 
We've also mapped the places where these people hang out and talk. So as you can see, hacktivists converse mostly on, on open social media platforms. Terrorists do it on closed and password protected forums. Criminals use the darknet in, in its various forms. Uh, and governments, well, they don't really talk. So they just work in, in secluded uh, places and they leak very little information, which means that we can't really obtain a lot about uh, know how about what they're doing. Uh, so we have to work with what we do, and and we use a, a lot of open information sources, starting from uh, from open media sources, which does have some interesting insights from time to time. So social media, of course, a lot of the activity is taking place today on, on social media platforms, web communities and forums public data and, and records, academic research, and, and security research, which is, uh, brings to life uh, vulnerabilities, and uh, the deep uh, web. Now, there's a lot of hype about deep web uh, and darknet. I'm not going to go into the theoretical discussion, but we need to make sure that people understand that there is a separation between the, the regular web, the CNN.com, that we all browse daily, and a deeper layer, which is comprised of uh, closed forums, of, of non-indexed content, of places where the user has uh, control over the privacy and the access, uh, where there's a lot of non-structured content or data, such as visuals and, and video, which means that search engines can't really uh, be useful to, to search it. Uh, and this is a much more difficult grounds to, to crawl in terms of cyber intelligence, but this is where the information or the interesting pieces of information reside. So this is where we and other companies and governments uh, focus our, our collection efforts. Uh, and to do this effectively, we've come up with a, with a toolkit, as we call it for our analysts. I'm pretty sure that the similar companies such as ours have developed the same uh, in other places. Governments, of course, they are using these for, for decades now. But we use a combination of, of secure browsing, uh, of social media and link analysis tools, uh, of course, uh, uh, malware analysis. And uh, to top it off, we use what we call virtual profiles or virtual entity, uh, which is the methodology that we use on a daily basis, and I will elaborate on uh, in a few moments. Uh, I speak about uh, the human and the analyst a lot, and uh, this is quite the, the opposite of what the industry is saying, so I'm just going to touch upon this for one second. Uh, we believe that uh, although this is a, a world when machines interact with machines and, and there's code uh, flying in packets, uh, in the end, we are talking about people. People are the victims, and people are the perpetrators of the crime. And in order to really interact with them, we have to have people on our side. And our intelligence analysts have uh, several advantages that machines, such as web callers or automatic language mechanisms, simply don't possess today. They might, they might have them in the future, but today it's simply not realistic. So, so on our team, we have linguistic capabilities, that, that span uh, Arabic, Farsi, Turkish, Chinese, Russian, and, and other languages. And I'm pretty sure that every cyber intelligence analyst should uh, be uh, well entrenched in the environment that they're working on. So they have to have a know-how of the jargon and the slang, which is sometimes very different from the uh, uh, official language. Uh, they have to have the contextual understanding, which happens when working with the uh, uh, with embedded identities over time. Uh, they have to have the ability to decipher unstructured content, such as, as visuals and videos, which uh, uh, automated mechanism usually fail to do. And they have the advantage that they can circumnavigate forums, captures, and, and all sorts of, of questions by administrators of the site, thus gaining entrance to places where search engines can simply not get into. The methodology that we use, and we know that it's been employed uh, worldwide, is what we call virtual human. Uh, there's a saying, and it's quoted in the book, uh, We Are Anonymous. It's well recommended if you have the time. 
uh, by Parmai Olson. That, that, that's the same in the underground at the internet, where men and when, men, women are also men, and children are FBI agents. Uh, we've taken this uh, and created the whole methodology around it, where we take our analysts, in this case, uh, Amir, which is working at the at Sensei headquarters, the RAM station, and we create a fake persona for him that allows him to better uh, access the places on the web which are interesting for him. So we created a guy called, called Yusuf. Uh, uh, this guy is supposedly located in, in Berlin. So we've created and we're using the right uh, IP address, so there's no way or there's very little chances uh, that he'll be traced back to us. And for all intents and purposes, he is a, a, a Muslim guy working within Germany. He's active on, on several platforms uh, for uh, uh, an amount of time that makes him look like a plausible person. And that's basically all you have to do. You have to be perceived as real. Nobody really cares about your real name because nobody uses that uh, in hackers' forum. So when you do that and you're active on, on, on social media, and here you can see example of Facebook, but uh, you can see example of, of Russian uh, platforms such as Odoplasniki and Viki. Uh, you can be active on, on Blackhead forums and on Darknet sites. Then you are perceived as real and as, uh, uh, you are able to actually converse with the hackers on the other side. So for uh, the typical solution, what we do is that we map the re relevant online platforms, we create and we actually tailor-made these, these entities or agents to infiltrate such platforms. We embed them uh, into these platforms. We work long enough to establish credibility. Uh, we monitor and alert when things are happening within this platform. And uh, we actively collect and analyze malware. And this entire uh, bucket of information is then distributed to our customers. And speaking of customers, we have found that uh, cyber intelligence uh, has various customers within, uh, within a client, as, as Paul mentioned. So people are consuming the information in different labels, being at the, the CISOs which uh, are getting the more uh, structured data, uh, such as alerts and reports, which helps them to set policies and, and uh, obtain resources within the organization. It goes in the form of, of training and, and reports to the highest management of the organization. Uh, for them, it's crucial to get uh, awareness. It goes to the operational people in the uh, security operation centers, in forms of uh, intelligence feed, which are actually connected to their system, uh, and also in forms of alerts, which tell them that they're going to be hit uh, next week. Uh, so far for the theoretical phase, uh, before I move on to the use cases, if anyone has questions they, they, they would like to ask, so, so please uh, type them to me. And if I'm not seeing any questions, I'll just move on to the first uh, use case. So uh, the first use case I'd like to talk about is uh, uh, an incident where we were called upon actually during a campaign that was launched against the clients of one of our banking customers here in Israel. So we didn't have the, the intelligence or the preceding intelligence because uh, the guy, the hacker, wasn't targeting the banks we, we, we were monitoring, but he was targeting the customers. Uh, we only knew very little about this guy. His, his alias was uh, Abdel Daraj, and we were required to reveal his identity and, and gather as much uh, information as possible we actually allowed them to, to prosecute this gentleman. Uh, so what we've, we've done is that we've built a, or a tailored made the entity. Uh, we tried to hook up with this guy uh, through his Facebook. We, we, we managed that. And we uh, were able to obtain his, his email address. And, and from that point on, things became uh, easier for us. 
this is the real guy, this, this, the real images of this guy. Uh, after we've obtained his email address, we've done some link analysis and we managed to get a lot of information about this guy. So he has a Google Plus account. He appears on, on Spokio, which is a people search engine. Uh, again, everything with the same hotmail address. Uh, he's even got a YouTube channel. He tweets regularly. And he's got a website which is uh, labeled, I need more Bitcoin. So he's also uh, operating in Bitcoin, a Bitcoin currency exchange. Uh, and we were actually able to compile a, a complete profile of this guy uh, using only, if you like, uh, 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 cyber intelligence tool. So no real forensic uh, work here by our team that wasn't necessary. We've done anything through, through link analysis and pure investigative work. We were actually been able to conclude that this guy, real name was Hassan Muhammad Hamdan, that he was born in the 90s in, in Amman, in Jordan. We've obtained his, his phone number, his real phone number. Uh, is, Real uh, location remained uncertain. It was either in Egypt or in Israel. But using this information was enough to, to take this to the law enforcement agency, the relevant one. And, and let's just say that this guy was apprehended and uh, this evidence was used in court later on. Just a very minor example of how cyber intelligence can be used against the bad guys. Uh, FBI are running large sting operations. We've done it on a very small scale and was quite uh, successful. So it is doable even by private enterprises. Again, his entire profile, his entire uh, uh, identities uh, and platform that he was using. Uh, moving on to hacktivism, I started the presentation by talking about the recent event that we're uh, facing right now. But uh, exactly a year ago, last September, uh, hacktivism uh, from the Middle East wanted to launch uh, an operation against uh, the United States uh, uh, using the ethics date of 9-11. They weren't able to get enough traction, so they re rebranded it as Operation Israel. But since there was already an Operation Israel earlier that year, they rebranded it Op Israel Reborn. And they were using the same platform, so the date remained on uh, September 11. They published a, a, a target list, first for, for U.S. Uh, entities and then for Israeli ones, so we were able to inform our customers well in advance. Uh, and we've actually managed to gather so, many, so much information about this group that we filed uh, an official abuse report to Facebook. And uh, several hours before the strike, they've actually shut down uh, some of the organization pages or the event pages. And the funny thing is that the, the rest, if you like to call it, our, our agent within the group was not exposed. So even after this uh, activity was shut down, he uh, maintained his identity and his cover, and he kept uh, reporting, if you like, from the within side. And you can just see some of their uh, responses. Facebook suspended our, our account. Uh, Dear Zuckerberg stopped censoring us. Uh, another example, this was one was written in Arabic, so it's a translation. And fortunately, Facebook suspended all the accounts of uh, of this guy, Brother Claudet, which is uh, one of the leaders. Uh, and this, prop, this uh, effectively dissolved the campaign. Uh, they were using this Facebook as a coordination platform, and with it gone, it was just a bunch of people trying to coordinate the night of service attack. Uh, and it just mesmerized the entire incident. So uh, this is an example of how active you can take this concept of uh, intelligence and apply it to real world and even uh, for the attack before they happen. Uh, another interesting event where we've touched upon state-sponsored or, or terrorist groups is uh, an incident that happened exactly a year ago, late July, early uh, August 2013. Uh, Israel was, uh, was hit by a, a group that was called the uh, Quds Freedom, Quds meaning uh, Jerusalem, which is holy, of course, for, for Muslims as well. And that group uh, labeled itself as, as being located in, in Gaza. 
and uh, being uh, uh, defending the oppressed uh, Palestinian people. It, it caused quite a havoc. They've launched several of denial of service attacks. Uh, here is a snapshot from their web pages allegedly hacking into bank accounts. We were unable to confirm that, but they've also done some, uh, some defacement with where they've changed the, uh, uh, the web page into uh, this image. Now, this image is an image of, uh, of uh, Hassan Nasrallah, which is a Lebanese uh, Muslim leader. And uh, they're quoting a very famous speech that he gave several years ago. Uh, but we noticed that there was something, uh, something weird about this quote, and we looked uh, deeply and we saw that there was a typo in Arabic. And we also tried to identify the origin of the font, and we found that it was from uh, Farsi or, or Persian keyboard. Uh, looking closely at the other evidence, we found that they were using the same, the exact same displacement pages for other uh, Iranian groups that, that we are well familiar with them. Uh, some of them have also launched uh, strikes against the United States. We saw that there was some media coverage of this group activity, but it was all only in Iranian media. So there was no Arabic, just uh, Iranian. And, and uh, we also know from, from our experience that uh, this is somewhat of a pattern within, within the Iranian uh, cyber group, uh, where they launch a very serious attack, but uh, they don't take uh, direct responsibility to use some sort of pseudonym, which is not uh, registered as Iranian. So Shamun, which was a very large cyber offensive against uh, Saudi Aramco, taking it uh, offline for about three weeks, uh, uh, was uh, performed by a group called the Cutting Sword of Justice, which is a very generic name. Uh, Operation Ababil, which was launched against the financial institutes within the U.S., and lasted nearly a year, was uh, done by the Dinal Kassam cyber fighter, uh, uh, name and is not uh, directly related to Iran. And Quds Freedom is the name that any uh, Muslim in the world could use, and it's not necessarily Iranian. So we have every reason to believe that this group was uh, portraying itself to be Palestinian, but it really was uh, Iranian, most likely uh, uh, state-affiliated. Uh, and we also have uh, very strong reasons to believe that it has uh, superior technical capabilities, which uh, the groups, the local groups here don't have. Uh, most notably, their volume of denial of service attack was quite impressive. And we haven't seen that uh, uh, since or before that. So uh, this case really shows what you can do with just linguistic, uh, contextual, and, and cultural analysis which are not uh, regularly used in, in cyber uh, in cyber security to uh, uncover the true identity uh, of the attacker. Uh, moving on to the last uh, test case which I'm going to describe, and if you recall, we, we started with the black box uh, malware. Uh, and here is a timeline that, that we've created of the events as far as the, we know them. Uh, on February, this uh, piece of malware was uh, was offered to sale on a Russian uh, black uh, uh, or underground forum. Uh, it was sold for several thousand US dollars. We, of course, notified our, our, our customers immediately. None of them were, were retail, by the way, so they weren't that uh, interested in this alert, but we gave it anyway. Uh, then about 10 months passed with no, uh, with no one mentioning this piece of malware. Uh, but then, and this was only became apparent uh, several months after the incident, uh, in mid-November, uh, a group, probably another Russian group, was man managed to insert this type of uh, malware into the payment systems of, of the, the retailer target. It was done through a third-party uh, uh, air conditioner uh, vendor. Uh, which had somehow, or for some reason, had the remote uh, linked into the system. And uh, about a month later, Brian Fred, which is an investigative reporter, uh, he published that there was a theft of uh, a large amount of credit cards. He didn't know exactly how many. It's between the 27th and, and mid, uh, mid uh, December, which is uh, uh, Cyber Monday and uh, pre Christmas shopping. So people were buying like crazy, 
while this uh, malware was actually logging their uh, credit card details and then dumping it somewhere. Uh, a day later, Target actually admitted that there was a breach. They said that about 40 million uh, cards were stolen. Uh, and a day later, these cards started to appear on the underground. We'll show you exactly how this looks on the underground. Uh, later on, another uh, 70 million uh, cards uh, were targeted, admitted that they were exposed, bringing the total to over 100 million cards. And a week later, a Russian guy called uh, Rinat Shabayev uh, was exposed to be the guy behind the Elliot report. So he was the guy who was actually selling this. Uh, but it didn't stop there. Uh, two months later, uh, Target uh, CIO resigned. Later, uh, Target CEO resigned. And uh, about a month and a half back, Target uh, has completed the overall of their IT security. Uh, uh, personnel and appointed new chief information security officer, which was a new function for them. So it all really started with a small, rather inexpensive piece of malware and resulted in loss, which uh, uh, by the estimates, they, they exceed one billion US dollar by now. Uh, so other than the original notification, we were called to action when this was made uh, public. And we went uh, to the Russian uh, party shops, tried to identify uh, stolen credit cards that belong to our banking customers. So these are some of the uh, shops that we discovered. Uh, this is a famous uh, forum called Zampedusa, and it pointed us toward a new store that was open specifically to, to sell these uh, huge amounts of, of credit cards. Uh, luckily for us, we've had previous access to this store. Uh, following this incident, the Russians have beefed up their security mechanism, and today, if you want to receive access to these forums and, and shops, usually you have to have about two or three people from within these groups to vet you. So if you don't have agents, uh, sleeping agents already within these groups, then uh, it's very difficult for you to do it. Legally, if you have the means to hack it, then by all means, uh, I would just say that we are not allowed to do such things. So everything that we do and operate is on the legal side, and I hope that our friends in the industry are adhering to the same uh, legal guidelines. Uh, once you're inside the store, the interface is very similar to Amazon or any other uh, retail. You just select, uh, select the country. In this case, we've had some uh, South African uh, banks who wanted to receive their credit card. You can select the type of credit card. In this case, it's an American Express. And then you can simply buy the, uh, the details. We've actually done so to verify that these are authentic, uh, of course, with the consent of our, of our customers. And they were uh, real cards used by real people. Uh, and I think that. This incident, most than, more than anything else, more than Stuxnet, more than Shamul, it exemplifies the world that we're in today. Uh, you don't even have to own a computer to be uh, the victim of a cyber crime. People actually shopped in Target stores. Uh, people, I don't think they even own a computer, but they were the victims of it nonetheless. So there's no more running away from, from the cyber criminals. Uh, and the only thing that we can do is beef up our security mechanism and, and raise the awareness. Uh, one word uh, before we move into my summary is that although it all looks uh, doom and gloom and uh, the Russian hackers appear to be evil people, uh, they're not. They actually have quite a sense of humor. So uh, Brian Krebs is a celebrity among the Russian underground. Uh, to the extent that uh, they've even made up several phrases uh, 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 around his name. Uh, for instance, if you go on a Russian underground phone, you, you ask a couple of questions in, in English and then you disappear, then the, the veterans there call you a proxologist, meaning you're a guy that resembles Brian Pratt, you're probably an investigative reporter, and no one should give you information. In another post, we've seen another very funny incident where a guy was trying to uh, promote his uh, malware and he wasn't getting enough traffic and he was asking people what he could do about it. And another guy said, well, you should just leak it to Brian Fred. He will give you enough publicity and you will have enough traffic and people will buy your malware. 
And uh, quite recently, we saw uh, uh, the public uh, gratitude of one of these forums, which actually thanked Brian Krebs for all the publicity that he gave them. And he urged people to thank Brian personally. And by doing that, it means either send him a pizza delivery or uh, invite a SWAT team to, to raid his house. That has happened several times. So these guys are very, uh, uh, are very much aware of what is going on. Uh, they're aware that they're the focus of every law uh, uh, intelligence office there in the world, and uh, they're doing what they can uh, to protect themselves. Having said that, they still need to move a large uh, amount of, of stolen data, be it credit cards, be it banking credentials. Uh, they invest a lot of money in developing very sophisticated malware, and they have to sell it. So they have to drive traffic, and uh, they expose themselves in that way. Uh, I would like to take on some questions for the forum uh, before I uh, give a little bit of uh, overview and, uh, and provide uh, some several details about my company. Thank you, Yo Tom. Um, yes, yeah, so if anybody has any questions, as I've alluded to in the chat feature. Um, you can put it to a chat directly to Yo Tom or to uh, the iSecure LLC um, avatar as well, and we can we can answer questions from there. Just to kind of do a post mortem from the iSecure perspective, this was a uh, a fantastic presentation. We're sitting here in our conference room, about seven or eight of us sitting around here watching it, and just really appreciating the fact of, of that there is an ability now, it seems like, to get more information. I, th I think the problem with that we've seen with security. Uh, from the cyber perspective is that a lot of the news media outlets really like to focus in on what, what we would deem sometimes as inaccurate information and uh, and really not go into the nuts and bolts of what some of these uh, some of these breaches and these hacks that have taken place and uh, with the uh, the cyber intelligence uh, mantra that you you said out there yo Tom it really helps um, organizations and folks we believe here um to uh to get really to the to the bottom of things so in you know from the 40 minutes that you spent speaking um i know from an eye secure perspective our our awareness for intelligence has definitely in increased so it was a uh, a fantastic presentation i don't see any questions on my chat yo tom do you see anything on yours uh no so i'll just okay. uh a very brief uh, overview of, of what we are actually yo tom i'm sorry yo tom i, I dig it i did get one question just now sorry about that what are some sites? Yeah, the question is: What are some sites where an organization with limited or no budget to undertake cyber intelligence? Uh, well, well, the question of uh, we call it the so what question. So you you come to an IT security professional, you tell him about uh, something that will happen, and and that's the question that he gets from him. So what? What can I do with this intelligence? And uh, I, I think that this is a terrific question and we shouldn't run away from it. And I think that what differentiates, as you said, intelligence from information is how applicable it is. So a good, good cyber intelligence, and again, there are a lot of companies who do that uh, in the industry today, has, has to be actionable. It can be an IP address or an IP address range that you can block within your defensive system. It can be a new type of, of, of phishing scheme that you should alert your people, which type of link they should not uh, they should not click on, or it should be a new trend that is now happening in the industry that your IT people and management should, should follow. So it has to be applicable. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that any company or uh, most company would ever have the resources to, to gather cyber intelligence and stuff. Uh, no, that, that is not the case. What people should do is they should, they should embrace the mentality that uh, they should receive cyber intelligence. And again, there's several terrific companies out there doing great job, and they should slowly start to integrate it into their solution. This, I think, is the only way where we can bring added value to the technology, which has been, as we all know, it's insufficient, and it's been proven uh, every day now. Great. We have another question here, um, Yo Tom, in regards to industries that um, that you are seeing that are needing to take advantage of um, 
of the intelligence? Is, is it um, is it Gnostic to any industry, or are you seeing more industries from your standpoint that are really starting to take cyber intelligence a little bit more seriously these days? Uh, again, a very, a very relevant question. Yes, we're seeing the, the financial industry is the leader in absorbing and implementing these solutions. Uh, but that's not surprising. They were probably the first to actually implement uh, very rigorous uh, IT security mechanism. They have the means, they have the awareness, and quite frankly, they're bleeding the hardest at the moment. But we are seeing other industries which have not been considered uh, to be targeted uh, until very recently, mainly the insurance, uh, healthcare, uh, education, and academia. They're all now realizing the need. Uh, and of course, the, the utilities and industrial sector, uh, which uh, I would have to be honest, these are the hardest ones for us to gain intelligence because it's not very common to find people talking about how to hack a SCADA or ICS system. It's a lot more common to find people uh, talking about new Trojans and new uh, uh, malware types. So these are the industries which are now starting the transition and absorption of such uh, intelligence. And I think in the end it will be commonplace uh, to almost any, any sector out there. Great, excellent, thank you for that. We have another question that just came in. And it's a question around what are companies spending too much time looking at now that they should stop doing? So basically, you know, what what are they? What are people spending too much time? On? What should the, what should the focus be on? Uh, well, there's a lot of talk about what we call technical intelligence. People are focusing on on a very technical type of intelligence, be it IP ranges or or signatures of of malware. Uh, it's a kind of an uphill battle because uh, according to recent estimates, and that's coming from an uh, antivirus vendor, uh, they encounter about 300 variants of malware per minute. So trying to, to log and, and patch this system accordingly is quite frankly impossible. Uh, what we're trying to do and others are trying to do as well, we try to catch these things, uh, if you like to call it uh, this way, while they're still in the shop, before they've hit the, the wild, before they've hit the marketplace and, and, and started uh, mutating. If you do that, then you have a good chance of security, securing your organization. And also you should be looking for, for leakage of information. Not enough companies are doing that. And we know that uh, uh, very scary numbers of organizations have been breached. So I would advise people to go and start looking for which kind of IP or customer information has been leaked. We know that there is greater awareness now and there is some uh, regulation about it. So we foresee this to be uh, becoming more uh, uh, standard in, in the coming years. Great, great. Thanks, Yo Tom. We have another uh, question that just flew in here. Uh, it's a little detailed, so just stay with stay with me on this one. So, can you, it's a couple parts of the question. The first part is, can you identify potential courses of action once a threat is identified? And it goes on to explain, in your first scenario, you identified a potential threat actor, a vector, I believe it is, and involvement in law enforcement. What if your intel identifies your organization more broadly as a DDoS or hacking target? what threat slash mitigations fit within the Intel space that allow you to be more proactive versus reactive, like in your target example. Do you get that? Yeah, uh, again, a very good question about how actionable the intelligence could be. Uh, in, in terms of, uh, I'll, I'll start with the easiest case of uh, hacktivist or denial of service attack. The, the fact that we can generate an alert sometimes uh, weeks before the actual event and we are telling the IT security people, you are going to be DDoS at uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We're going to tell you how many people are partaking uh, in this uh, action. We know which tools they're using because they usually share these uh, DDoS tools. Uh, you can patch your system so much better. Uh, in fact, you can even decide to take them offline for several hours if that's what you want to do. You can buy DDoS mitigation service. The cost of the DDoS uh, attack is about $20,000 uh, per, per hour. 
So with that in mind, if you know a specific time frame where a data uh, will occur, and you can only buy the meters delegation uh, service for that time frame, you'll be saving a lot of money, which otherwise you'll be spent. You can also do very good things for your reputation. I'll give the counter example. During one of these operations, I was in, uh, in Eastern Europe, and I tried to access my bank account here in Israel, and I couldn't. It was blocked. And when I got back home, I talked to this uh, bank uh, security people, and they told me that they've just uh, blocked the entire Eastern European IP range. Now, I didn't have anything specific uh, that I wanted to do with my bank account in these days, but and I wanted to do something. Uh, there were a serious uh, liability issue here because they denied me this, this privilege. Uh, so it would have been much better to them just you know, shut down the service for several hours, get good data mitigation service, you know, even notify your customers in advance. Look, this is going to happen. We can't run away from that. But at least you know in advance and, and in terms of, uh, of visibility and, and your reputation, you will maintain your integrity with your customers. And uh, regarding phishing and, and, and malware, the fact that we can obtain uh, the original or the source of the malware in advance, sometimes we can buy it in the store, other times they, they share it with us, or we can get it from, from other uh, sensors that we deploy, and, and we then uh, blast it in the sandbox and we create the signatures for that, and we can implement it in the security mechanism, then uh, the system will automatically uh, uh, contain the threat when they encounter it, and, and we've created some sort of buffer for them which they didn't have before. So this is uh, in terms of implementing or using this in the intelligence, these are just some of the things you can do. And you can also do very trivial stuff, like uh, if you see a type of phishing or another threat uh, that is just uh, you've just been made aware of, you know, just notify all your employees, raise your awareness. Uh, we know that 50% of, of the major attacks happen through phishing e or spear phishing emails. So if you just raise your awareness a little bit, you can get uh, great, uh, great benefit just from, from that point. Great, great, Yo, Tom. Great answer, and I, I believe that was appreciated from the uh, the person who asked that as well. Excellent, excellent questions, everybody. Thank you for the participation there, um, Yo, Tom. I believe that the chat has um, ended for Q and A. Um, I know that you want to tie you wanted to tie some things up at the end here. We have six minutes before the top of the hour, so I wanted to hand it back to you before we officially close out. All right. Uh, again, this is an educational session, so I'm not going to go into marketing stuff. Uh, so I'm just going to go quickly about us. Just about the name, uh, we've tried to look for a name that doesn't contain the word cyber and intelligence because it has been used in almost any perceivable combination. So we chose the name Sensei, which uh, is kind of a pun. Uh, it, it combines the word sensing and, and cyber. And it also uh, uh, signifies that we kind of want to be like a mentor or a tutor and, and help people and guide them through this uh, jungle of cybersecurity. Uh, we have a complete suite of cyber intelligence solutions and cyber intelligence feed. Uh, I, uh, we also comprise reports, but that's less interesting. I really, really encourage you to follow us. We try to publish any interesting piece of information on our uh, blog and, and, and YouTube channel and, and with this. So there's a lot of great content. Again, this is all real stuff, like everything that I've shown today, real life examples uh, from the specific uh, names that the hackers like to use to the graphics that they put on the website, uh, to the slang and jargon that they're using, anything which is interesting and it's not commonplace, uh, we, we like to publish it. And uh, the final thing that I like to do is uh, as a thank you for all the people that have, uh, uh, have joined this uh, terrific WebEx. Uh, if you send uh, an email to, to, our, to our address, we'll uh, open uh, an newsfeed account, which will let you sample our newsfeed. This is, of course, uh, free of charge. Uh, and we're happy to give that to everyone. We think this is a great tool to uh, encourage uh, awareness. Uh, and uh, again, I would like to thank uh, 
Paul and the team for, for hosting me here today. It was a great opportunity. If you'd like to keep this discussion, please, you can contact me directly or through uh, uh, Paul and I secure. And uh, I'll be very happy to, to send some further materials. We have a lot of uh, information that we can share. Uh, and again, I really encourage you to go to our website and log this uh, terrific material we try to post uh, almost daily. Great. Yo, Tom, thank you so much. Um, I, I feel that this was a great kickoff to our webinar week. Um, and you set the stage very nicely here. So we greatly, greatly appreciate it. I thought this was a fantastic presentation. Again, folks, if um, if you're interested in taking advantage of your Tom's offer, um, feel free to email Donna Smith also here at iSecure, who can coordinate that for you. We get the hand, we can get um, that into your hands uh, from your Tom as well. Uh, and then, you know, if you're interested in getting a recording, in case you, you're sitting there thinking, man, I wish so and so from my organization would have heard that. Uh, we're going to be working on packaging this out with the other webinar series as well. Um, but if there's an urgent need for that, please feel free to reach back out to the folks at iSecure and we'll work on getting that quickly as well. Again, thank you so much, Yo Tom, and thankfully uh, no, no sirens went off during it. And uh, from us at iSecure, we wish you uh, sincere safety for you and your family. Thank you, and uh, thanks to everyone who participated, and uh, have a great day. Thank you, everybody. Take care.